welcome this evening to the open source um, specialist group as part of the, the BCS. And this evening we're going to talk about open sourcing government, which has um, become quite a hot topic over the past I don't know, eight years or so since GDS was formed, the Government Digital Service, who really pioneered how we get open technologies into government. We've got three amazing speakers. We've got um, Terence, who is now at NHS, Terence Eden, who is now at NHSX, part of the, um, the new digital NHS. Um, Irina Bolachevsky, who's going to talk about how she sold some open source into government in, quite, in the early days. And um, Esther Newman, who's going to tell us about open source in Europe, which is something that we don't hear very much about in this country. So um, I'm very excited to hear about that one. Anyway, um, firstly, I'm going to hand over to um, Terence Eden, who's going to bust some myths about why people don't want to buy open source software. Terence. Thank you very much indeed. So uh, hello, everyone. Hello, everyone on the internet as well. Hello. There's people inside that camera. Um, Okay, uh, my name is Terence Eden, MBCS. Um, I work for NHSX, which is a newish part of government. We're a joint working group between the Department of Health and Social Care and the uh, NHS in England. And we're looking at uh, making the experience of technology throughout the NHS better. And that's better for staff, it's better for patients, it's better for everyone. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about... Um, what we're doing in NHSX, but also I'm going to draw on um, some of the experiences that I've had at GDS, Government Digital Service. So there, there'll be a bit of overlap here. Um, if at any point I say anything which uh, doesn't make any sense or you don't understand the acronym I've used or something like that, please stick up your hand and ask, because I guarantee if you are confused, someone else in the room will be confused uh, as well. So um, we, why, why open source? I mean, open source is just long-haired hippies faffing around with code on GitHub is not real, is it? You know, is it, yeah, we, why, why would we use that in the NHS? No, of course it's real. A, open source is, is an amazing gift from, uh, well, from us to each other. Uh, and so I really want to talk about why it is absolutely vital that the NHS adopts open source. And by adopt open source, I don't just mean, oh, we'll, we'll use jQuery or, you know, we might get a, a library from over there. I, I mean, we should be developing it. We should be releasing it. We should be sharing it with the world. And yeah, we should be, we should be buying it uh, as well. So the first is why, why do this? Well, uh, if you feel like reading lots of long policy documents, take a look at the uh, NHS's uh, long-term plan and we've got a technology vision and all sorts of things out there but what it boils down to is being open is the right thing to do it is generally speaking cheaper it is cheaper for us to code in the open it's cheaper for us to use open source and uh, we need to save money you know the NHS does not have an unlimited budget we need to make sure that we are getting great value for money and we see open source uh, as being part of that it is faster. I don't mean that the code runs any faster. I mean that it is faster for us to develop. It is faster for us to pick up solutions which have been well tested around the world and which are open and which we can see and which we can adapt for ourselves rather than, um, you know, going through big, slow waterfall projects where we buy off the shelf kit and then have to customize it and then pay other people to do it. You know, th this is stuff we can do for ourselves. We believe it is, is more secure and I'm going to get onto that. And finally, uh, we believe it's it's morally right. It is the right thing to do. So uh, this is when the NHS creates code, that code is paid for by you, the taxpayer. You have, we believe you have the right to see the code that you have paid for. Does anyone think that's a, that's a, that's a terrible reason? No, good. I mean, it's, it's just obvious, you know, you have paid for this code. You could probably FOI it, uh, for, send a Freedom of Information Act request for it. So why don't we just publish it for anyone to see? We also think, you know, more and more of our, life, our lives are run by algorithms, by computers. Kind of think you ought to have the right to examine those algorithms and those systems. When you receive a letter which says, you know, according to our scans, you have this horrible disease. Perhaps you want to go and take a look at the computer code which made that analysis. Perhaps you want to understand why uh, there are bugs popping up. Uh, in the code that you see when you interact with NHS services. We think that it is the right thing to do to let the people who've paid for it, and indeed anyone who really wants to take a look at it, to look at it. That's that's the beauty of, of open source. Um, so 
this is another one. Uh, how many people here have had the same job for their entire life? Like worked for the same company? No, no one. Anyone there on the internet? No. It, it just doesn't happen. I would love it if every developer that was working in the NHS stayed with us forever. You know, that would be lovely. But the reality is it doesn't happen. And the reality is the NHS cannot afford to pay the same sorts of salaries as Google, Facebook, or the other, you know, trendy startup that I've not heard of. You know, we, we don't have the money for that. But what we can do is say, you'll be working on a really important mission. You will be working on the health of the nation. Okay, that's great. You know, some people are attracted to that. But the next thing we can say is, you'll have a portfolio. Not only will you work on the mission, but when you go to your next job and we fully expect you to leave us to go for you know, a job somewhere else and they say, hey, can you give us an example of a time when you wrote a system which did blah, 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 you'll be able to go, well, yeah, take a look on github.com or gitlab.com slash NHS and you can see my code running uh, and you can see the pull requests that I've made and the way that I interact with people. We, we think that's a, an attractive uh, thing for getting talented developers. You know, we're, we're very selfish. We want good developers. We know we can't necessarily pay them as much as uh, a big megacorps, but we can say your code will be open. People will be able to see it. People around the world will be able to use it. And, and we, think that's, we think that's a good thing. So it's not all sunshine and roses. I mean, it's great. I, I'm standing here as um, the head of open technology at NHSX, and I get to go around and say, hey, open source is awesome. And everyone goes, well, yeah, open source. Except they don't. We, we get quite a lot of people going, hang on, we can't use open source because. So I, I uh, just uh, with a show of hands, how many people here work in the public sector? A few of you and the rest of you private sector, I assume. And on the internet, about the same. Um, so you, when you go back to your office tomorrow and say, we need to start doing more open source, we need to release open source, we need to use open source, you, someone in your office is going to say, we can't do that because. So I'm going to tell you the excuses that we have heard and how to strike back. Um, we were, I'm very on brand today, I've just realized. So um, obviously not striking back in a violent sense. I mean, the, here is how to have some reasoned discussions with people who might not be as um, up to date with open source as, as you are. So the first one that we get is open source is not secure enough. It's full of hackers. Hackers can see your code and that's bad. Put your hands up if you've heard that before. Yeah, it's 100% true, everyone. Definitely true. Hackers everywhere. And the thing is, this, this is a myth. So uh, the NCSC, the National Cyber Security Center, have um, published all sorts of guidance on the use of open source. And the conclusion that they've come to is it's basically just as secure as closed source stuff. Um, and, and we have some real great examples of this. Um, some of you might recognize, hopefully not too many of you will recognize this screen. This is WannaCry. This is ransomware. This is ransomware which ran rabid through the NHS a couple of years ago. Um, and it's a crypto locker thing. It encrypts all your files. Pay us loads of Bitcoin, otherwise you won't get your data back. Horrible, you know, nasty thing. Um, and this infected lots of Windows computers. Uh, and as many of you will know, Windows is not open source. Windows is closed source. Just, just something being closed source is no protection against uh, hackers and threats and things like that. We, you know, all, you know, lots of the threats that we see are targeted against closed sourcing. It, it doesn't seem to slow down hackers in any, or say hackers, uh, criminals, I suppose, in any meaningful sense. Um, and all the evidence that we've seen so far suggests that there is no, um, there is no security downside in running properly maintained open source systems. Now, I, I stress that very clearly. If we had had, if we were running Linux on the desktop, this year, everyone, this year is the year of Linux on the desktop. Um, one day. If we'd been running Linux all throughout the NHS, would this have happened to us? Yes. All right, it wouldn't have been WannaCry, but the, the problem that we had wasn't that we were running Microsoft Windows. It was that we were running old, uh, outdated, unpatched versions of Windows. If we'd left old Ubuntu and Slackware boxes up on the network, yes, they would have been taken over and compromised in some way. Um, you know, our, our security teams did a brilliant job in cleaning this up and, you know, getting everything patched and secure. Uh, and, you know, it, open source wouldn't have saved us in the same way. There, lots of the problems that we have are around how we use the technology, not whether the technology is open source or not. Um, our work is too sensitive. We can't use open source. Just stick your hands up if you work for the security services or anyone like that. 
is the right answer. Um, in healthcare, you know, we are, when I say open source, and I say open data and open technology, people think that I'm going to put people's medical records up on GitHub. That is not what we're going to do. Your medical records are saying nice and secure somewhere else. We're not opening those up. But, you know, we are opening up the code which interacts with them and, you know, interacts with your patient record and, and stuff like that. Um, so, you know, there's a real concern that with health, health privacy, um, you know, our, our code is really sensitive. We can't use open source. But the thing is, this is GCHQ. They code in the open. They've got a whole bunch of open source stuff there. This is uh, National Crime Agency. They're also on GitHub as well. You know, these are the people who track down hardened criminals. They are quite convinced that open source is both, you know, secure enough and can be used in sensitive environments. Um, I think we in uh, the NHS should uh, take notice of that and you uh, working in presumably slightly less secure uh, environments than GCHQ should also uh, note that. I love this one. What if we accidentally commit secret keys? Stick your hands up if you have ever accidentally committed your password or an API key somewhere you shouldn't. Liar, liar. Like you're, everyone has. I'm sorry, but everyone has gone. Ah, oh, I didn't mean to do that. This, this is a this is typed into Slack. Oh, um, only done that once myself. But you know, this is this is a real fear that people have. You know, if we've got people, you know, working on, you know, whether it's GitHub or GitLab or, you know, some public thing at some point, you know, oh, what if they commit secret keys? And to this, I say, good. Yep. It, it is a good thing for people to accidentally commit uh, API keys and security tokens like that. It is an absolutely brilliant thing because it will be a wonderful test of your disaster recovery process. You, you do have a disaster recovery process, don't you? What, what I mean is, and uh, you know, this, this happens uh, when I was at GDS, someone accidentally committed the key. You know, shouldn't have happened. There were two people checking it. These things happen. We know that. So you push the big red button. All the keys get rotated. That key is invalidated. And you start scanning, and it automatically starts scanning the logs to make sure no one has used it inappropriately. And then you can report it, you know, up the normal channels. This is what you should be doing as a matter of course anyway, whether you use open source or not. So, you know, having developers who do a daft thing shouldn't stop you from using open source. You should have robust measures in place because someone, you know, even if you use closed source, someone is going to write a password down on a post-it note and lose that post-it. Someone's phone is going to get robbed from them, you know, by someone on a bike in central London. They, these things happen. Um, and it's not open source which makes this dangerous, it, it's poor processes. Um, we also, oh yeah, I think I've got time for this. Um, what, one of the slides that I used to have in here was, um, what if our developers commit rude messages in the source code? Hire better developers? I don't know, you know, uh, pe people do daft things, but hopefully you are hiring professionals who aren't going to write this code Use your imagination there or, you know, especially if you're working in the public sector, you don't want people putting their thoughts on political matters in code and committing them. But, the, you know, this is part of how you train people to use and work with, with open source. I'm confused by all these licenses. What if we get sued? Uh, hands up everyone who's read all of GPL v3 and understands it. No one. It's too long. Um, this is a concern. No one wants to get sued over using source code. And, you know, some of the code that we use in, in government was written a long time ago by people who no longer work there. What's the provenance of that code? You know, did, did we write it? Do we have the rights to open source it? Um, and again, th this comes down to your policies and procedures. We need to make sure that from the very first line of code committed, you know what the license is that you're going to use, that you have got every you know, when you're pulling in open source licenses that you know that, oh, actually, you can't combine a GPL v3 library if it's statically linked with a, it's, it's sometimes complex. The solution that we've come to, and it's not, I would say, a good solution, is just to use MIT for everything. Um, and MIT is the shortest readable license. You know, even if you give it to some really high priced lawyers, it's like two paragraphs. There's not a lot they can charge for, you know. Um, but it's simple. It says anyone can reuse this. You don't have to share it back, um, which is which is good. Are we getting messages from the ether? That's just, okay. Oh, that's okay. Can people hear me? Are you receiving me? Are you receiving me? Good. Um, We've also, one of the reasons we chose MIT is because it is simple. I'm not convinced it's the best license. I'm really not. We, we use it because it's easy to explain to people. 
I mean, you can explain it in a breath. Anyone can do whatever they want with the code. They can't sue us, right? But perhaps we should be looking at stronger licenses. I know that, uh, for example, the EU has the EUPL, uh, EU Public License, which is basically, I think, MIT, but they've replaced the words MIT with European Union. Maybe it's a bit more than that. But it, so you need to have a discussion about what is appropriate if you want people to share it, if you are, are we happy? Here's a really interesting question for public sector. Um, we write this code, someone then takes it, wraps it up and then sells it to someone else. Is that cool? Are we, are we happy with people profiting off public sector code? I don't know. Are, are we happy? There, there's been a lot of talk about ethical licensing. You know, do we want to say you're only allowed to use this license for good? It gets really tricky. I don't have the answers. I would love to discuss at length with people what the right answer is for this, because at the moment, I'm not sure we, we've got it right. No one is interested in our code. Oh, so, but listen, I've, I've sat in, in rooms where I said, well, we could open source it. No one's going to care. That just makes my, my little heart break because so what? I mean, if the worst thing that happens is you put it out and everyone goes, huh, and ignores it, well, you've not lost anything. You know, your developers were still going to be learning how to use Git and, you know, doing all these best practices. It goes out there, doesn't make a splash. Well, okay, you've not lost anything. Um, but the thing is, everyone is interested in your code. Might not be today, might not even be this year, might be in a hundred years time when archivists are trying to work out, you know, what life was like in the distant year 2000. Uh, people will want to see this code eventually. And, and the thing is, especially in the NHS and especially in the public sector, we keep doing the same thing over and over again. Now, I, I've worked for big companies, like really big companies, and at least, you know, once a week I would be chatting with someone and find out that they were working on exactly the same project I was working on, but for a different team. I think we've all experienced this. And you go, well, if we, how much money are we wasting? How much time, how much people's effort are we wasting in the NHS by having two people in two different hospitals code the same thing? Well, if one of them can start coding in the open and start releasing it, that means when the next person goes, all right, has anyone else done something like this? Oh, great, I found someone else who's done it. I will borrow their code, I will reuse it, or I will look at it and go, I do not want to make all the mistakes they've made, I'm going to start again. People will be interested, people will reuse. And it is, it is absolutely, um, I think, a moral duty for us to make that code available, not just for you to, to examine, but for every other hospital and trust and GP and you know everyone in the health sector around the UK to be able to look at it and go, great, you've saved me an hour, a day, a month, a year of work because I can just take your code, slap my logo on it and deploy it. I know deploying open source isn't quite that easy, but you, you get the picture. What if other countries steal our code? All those other countries stealing our code, what are they? Well, good. You know, the, the, the NHS is not in competition with the other health services around the world. You know, we, we are not like a, a social network vying for customers. We're not an app, you know, trying to climb up the charts. We want people around the world to be healthy. If someone sees our code and, you know, on, uh, you know, data about coronavirus or whatever it is, and we can release that and other people can use it and make their citizens and people resident in their country healthy, that's good because sick people around the world is bad. Open source, I'm not going to say that, you know, open source is going to cure every disease. It's not, is it? No, definitely not. But when we start making this stuff more affordable, especially for countries which can't normally, you know, afford really high tech solutions, we level up everywhere. We make people healthier everywhere. And that's a net positive for, for all of us. Um, and just as some non NHS examples. Um, so the New Zealand government took the source code for, I, I think this is Gov UK and uh, they turned it upside down because they're on the other side of the world, but um, I've righted the picture this way so you can see it. Um, Great, you know, this means that New Zealand uh, have a fantastic new website, wonderful, but it also means that, you know, the UK is seen as a powerhouse in terms of producing good, solid, open source government code. Uh, we saw the same thing uh, with the government of Israel. Uh, Australian government took the digital marketplace code, which uh, GDS had developed. And I think there's a blog post about this, so I, forgive me if I get the numbers wrong, but I think it took them six weeks 
to spin this up from going from getting the sign off to do it to having a live code they i mean it wasn't quite as simple as clone the github repo deploying kubernetes and off you go but you know it wasn't really uh you know a huge long procurement exercise because all the code was open and we were able to explain how it worked so i've given you the sort of sunshine and roses version so shall i stop there or should we go for the yeah let's just start everything's fine with open source it's all good um it's not so there there are some problems especially in the public sector especially in places like uh, the nhs and and it's worth examining them because i think they will inform perhaps the way you respond not only to our code but the way you expect people to respond to your code as well so People can be nervous showing their code to the public. I would love it if all of our developers were 10x ninja rock stars or you know whatever, but the reality is you know we hire lots of junior devs and we hire lots of people who aren't necessarily confident about talking about what they do in public and to all of a sudden say, all that hard work you've done, we're going to put it on GitHub and anyone can criticize you. That's it's not a nice position to be in, especially if you're not uh, someone who is, I don't want to say confident, but you know, if this is your first experience of doing something like this and you think the whole world can see my code, you know, what if, what if I've committed some huge blunder and I never work in this town again? What, you know, what if everyone laughs at me? It, it is, you've got to be supportive of your team. You've, you've got to understand their fears, which are, you know, can be very real. You've got to make sure that they are doing the right thing. When it comes to committing code publicly, you make sure that it goes through all the normal reviews and you know you make sure someone senior signs it off and if it really is dreadful well it's the senior person's fault not the junior person's fault you know coding in the public is a team sport uh, and it is we, we've got to support each other it, it is so important um especially as we're trying to build up this practice of open source coding we do not want people's experience of it to be overwhelmingly negative and so some of that might be you pre-moderate um, issues before they go up on github or, or things like that so have a think about what it is that you want to get out from the public commenting on your code especially if people are, are a bit nervous about this this is sometimes external people have questioned choices without having the full context what i mean is only an idiot would have chosen that library why have you used this sort of people on the internet are assholes okay uh, sh this shouldn't come as a surprise not not you people on the internet you're lovely all of you are there are there being mean comments on the internet about me yet please don't send mean comments Pe people can be absolute assholes on the internet and you've probably done it you've probably tweeted something oh why on earth are they using this update oh my god i can't believe that they got hacked by this stupid vulnerability but you don't know what people uh, are working on. You don't know the fact that we need to use this version of the library because the old closed source thing over there requires compatibility. So you have to do a really good job of explaining why, you're, why you've made certain choices. And I often say that you know, documentation is almost more important than anything else, it's almost more important than the code. You need to explain why you have chosen certain things, why this pattern happens, why you have to deploy it in this certain way. Um, because people don't know the context that you're working under. They don't know the fact that you were asked to do this and you only had three weeks and you were reusing someone else's. What they see is you know, an overpriced government team developing crap code. Um, and, and that's not the case. You know, we're all working under constraints. Um, and you, you know, if you're, if you're in the public sector or the private sector, you'll, you'll find that as well. People will question what you've done. It's up to you to preempt those questions um, and, and protect your team. Because I, as I say, you, you don't want to put people off contributing. Um, and it, it's exactly the same. One of the things that you might find is that your uh, employees want to contribute code back to open source projects. And we we thoroughly encourage that. But if they do it under their name and their name is attached to your department or your employer, it can get a bit weird. So there is a, um, a wonderful thing. Uh, I think it's GCHQ. Uh, as I said, they've got a um, GitHub page. They occasionally make pull requests to other people's codes. Mostly, you know, it's all sort of training stuff and, oh, we've developed a library and here you go. And they make sure that their usernames, I'm, I'm fairly sure on this, are, you know, it's Bob S underscore GCHQ. So there is no pretense that, you know, someone sneaky from the security services is trying to undermine things. You know, you want to be as open as possible. Similarly, you want to make sure that if people are committing code, 
on your behalf to public projects that they've signed the contributor license that they've spoken with the people that they're sending code to and that they do it in an open and transparent way so no one thinks hang on why is the government monkeying around why is the nhs trying to change this code over here um, because this is what it comes down to open source is a community i say community i was going to say family but not not everyone likes their family, um, but we, we, are a, we are a community and we should work together as a community, whether, whether you're public sector or private sector, whether you're, if you're in the NHS, you know, we are, we're not one big NHS, we're lots of different pockets of NHS, but we've got to work together as a community. When we're looking at the open source code that other people have produced and we're using, we want to be good citizens of that community, good members of that community and say, you know, here's how we're going to help you. Um, um, you know, here's how we're going to promote your open source. And in return, you know, we want people to not necessarily say nice things about us, but, you know, if you spot a bug in NHS code, raise an issue, raise a pull request, be part of the community, you know, work with us because we, we are definitely trying to make the world a better place through what we're doing. And that is everything I have to say. Thank you very much. Cheers. So I think we have a few minutes for questions, about five or 10 minutes for questions. Any questions? Uh, well, first of all, uh, uh, if people on the, people in the internet, you can leave a question. Not if you're watching this later, don't leave a question. I won't see it. But if you're watching it live, leave a question. Um, yes, uh, if you just say who you are and where you're from. Craig Gallen, Open NMS. Craig Gallen, Open NMS. Um, I think it's Karen Sandler from the Go Gnome Foundation has a great talk where she talks about uh, pacemaker she had fitted and she wanted the open code to be open sourced because she didn't trust the developers. Uh, have you got an, a, a, an opinion on medical appliances <laughs> and whether they should be open sourced or not? Do I have an opinion or does the NHS have an opinion? Um, so yeah, uh, you, you should look up Karen Sadler's talk because it, yes, it's exactly that. It's about, can you make it, you know, my pacemaker is an open source. Can you trust the code running on it? Um, at the moment, what we're concentrating on is open standards. So uh, there's been some uh, stuff in the news recently, I think about uh, glucose monitors. If you're a diabetic and you've got a, a patch and um, the whole bunch of manufacturers are saying, we're gonna pump this information out in a proprietary format. And so all your open source tools to read your medical data won't work. Uh, and we have written a very stiffly worded letter to those people saying, we, we don't like that idea. And so we're trying to push for, for open standards. Now, we cannot tell a private company how to run their business. Um, so we can't say you must make all of your products open source. What we can do is look at um, things in the NHS contract and perhaps say, um, maybe we would say preference would be given, or we might say we will not disadvantage anyone who releases open source uh, for, for their pacemakers and things like that. The, the problem comes, um, and this isn't just an open source problem is, okay, so, so the code for your pacemaker is open. Does that mean that you can reprogram your own heart? Should you be able to? Well, GPL version three says, yes, you should be able to. I'm not sure if I want people running hacked firmware on their NHS supplied pacemakers. I, um, may, maybe I'm not sufficiently zealot enough about open source. So I, I think being able to examine the code, yes, absolutely. Um, I think some of the more open, I was gonna say radically open, maybe I don't mean that. Um, we, when we look at apps, for example, you know, if you've got a medical app, whether it's open source or not, you want to be kept abreast of the changes and sometimes we'll need to recertify things. Um, so there can be a problem with recertification, especially if things are open source and then other people start contributing to them. Um, I'm sorry, that's a bit of a wishy-washy answer just because some of this stuff is a bit new and frightening. Um, and some of it we, we haven't worked out and we need to do lots of work with the community both the manufacturers and the people who want to hack their own hearts um, to do that. Uh, yes, at the back, if you could just pass this back, just say who you are. Nathan Young, Newspeak House. Is there any evidence of uh, open source stuff being used by governments of developing nations as opposed to, the example she gave are very wealthy governments, but is there any support there? Uh, yes, there there are. Um, so GDS uh, have been doing a whole bunch of work with, I'm going to forget all the countries, but I, I think uh, Bangladesh uh, is one and, and some other 
um, nations that you wouldn't necessarily expect to have, you know, really high tech IT scene perhaps. So yes, we, we do see that. Um, we know that people bodge together all sorts of medical devices out of open hardware and, you know, you, you can go online and find all sorts of examples of that. Now, some of the stuff that we develop is very specifically for, for UK context, but we try to comply with international open standards as so things like uh, SNOMED CD, uh, CT, uh, ICD-10, moving to ICD-11. Uh, and the idea is that um, any country can use those standards, which means that they will be able to take our code and reuse it in, in an open context. Now, in terms of international health stuff, I'm going to have to look into that because I, I think it's fascinating. So my job is, as I said, for uh, the UK's Department of Health and Social Care and NHS England. So naturally, we are slightly focused on, uh, on uh, our local area. But I'm going to go away and look at that because I think if we can make the argument successfully that we're helping people around the world, especially in developing nations, then that's that's fantastic. Uh, there's a question at the back, so I just. Uh, there's a question from the internet. Um, James Arthur Cattell asks, uh, Terence mentioned Linux on the desktop or lack of it. Is this something he'll pursue via NHSX? Thanks, James. Um, yes, it is. So, um, those of you with long memories will know that Linux on the desktop has been coming this year for the last, what, 20 years? Um, I am hopeful that I will be running Linux on my work laptop uh, in, in the next few weeks. Um, there, there are some pilots going on. Uh, I, I know about that. But, but as I said, the, we know that more and more health stuff is accessed via the browser. So, theoretically something like a, a Chromebook or, you know, a button two running Firefox or, you know, whatever it is, could serve a huge amount of need and be fairly low cost. The problem is always going to be, um, do we have the support in IT support, uh, do we have IT support to cope with Linux on the desktop? Now, I, I run Linux at home and I'm always running apt get and install and you know sometimes display drivers break and I, I guess that sometimes happens with windows as well but we don't necessarily have the back-end support for, for linux on the desktop but as i said pe people are doing trials of it um i'm going to be running it in nhsx and we are going to see what happens so i i am not i'm categorically not promising linux on the desktop for every gp that's probably not going to happen anytime soon but yes it, it's something that we'll we are looking into Terence, thank you very much. A very interesting talk. I want to just pick up and perhaps expand a bit on the licensing question, um, because I suspect your comment later about documentation and explanation probably applies there more than anything else, and it frustrates me as a professional in the field that in open source you spent far more time on legal things than you ever do in closed source. The danger with any of the so-called permissive licenses is that the people getting permission are those who wish to take advantage. And I wonder if it's worse for the NHS because the N NHS in some sense is in the moral high ground. It's, it's a loved institution. And the idea of exploitative approaches, the good things about um, the copyleft style license is it says, there's a deal. You get this, but if you use it, you give back. And, and I wonder if that might matter. Um, yes, I think it does. Um, I've never been accused of taking the moral high ground, so that's always very nice. Um, so we, one of the problems with copyleft stuff, especially as it pertains to commercial use, is what is commercial. So we release, uh, I'm not going to talk about open source specifically, but we release lots of data as open data. Um, so waiting times and things like that. And we put that under a very permissive license. It's OGL, Open Government License, which is creative, effectively Creative Commons attribution. Um, now, if you are, uh, pick a very large company. If you're Microsoft and you take that data and you use it to build something, which you then later sell, is that commercial use? How do we put data out there so that, you know, a researcher um, at a university can use those data for really good things? but not so that a big evil pharmaceutical company can take all that data and make millions and billions out of it. We don't have a good answer for that. And it's the same with source code as well. It, uh, might people resell our source code and make money of it? Well, possibly, but I think the thing 
that we're finding more and more is that the code itself isn't the valuable part of the transaction. It is the service behind it, um, which is valuable. So, you know, if someone in a hospital has written a canteen menu displayer or, a, you know, a ward finder and someone goes out and commercializes it, if they can do a better job of running it than we can, well, is that a good thing? Is that going to save us time and money, even if we have to pay for it? The, these are questions to which we don't have the answer yet, but um, I am very interested in people's opinions. I, I go around doing a lot of these things. I also take a lot of emails. Please do feel free to email me with, you know, what you think. We, we are going to be consulting because one of the things that NHSX really wants to embed is not just open source, open standards, open data, but it's an open attitude. We want to be collaborative and we want to look at user needs. So is that, is that a question or is that time? Okay, you have a question, right? Sorry. Um, hello, Andy, Andy Bennett, um, uh, organizer of BCS Open Source Group. Um, so yeah, a, a similar but different question about licenses. Well, when we did GDS, we picked MIT for lots of reasons, but in the main, the competition isn't big business. Whereas medicine is, especially in some countries, very big business. Did you think about patent clauses and things? Um, if so, what did you think about them? <laughs> um, so I, I am not a patent lawyer or indeed any sort of lawyer, much to my mother's disappointment. So um, I, I can't really answer that in terms of what we're thinking about. Um, I, as far as I'm aware, the government can't patent things itself or the government can't be a patent holder. And I don't think the NHS can as well. I'm sure someone will correct me if I'm wrong. Um, and I, I think that also extends to things like individual trusts as well. So uh, the answer is I don't think it, I don't think it kind of counts for what we're doing just because of the institution we are. If you're a private institution or you're particularly interested in patents, again, I don't think software patents themselves are valid in the, the UK, but you should speak to a proper patent lawyer, not someone wearing a, a silly t-shirt up on stage. Um, right, well, I think that is all the time that I have. So uh, once again, thank you very much indeed. Cheers, everyone. Thanks. Well, thank you very much, Terence. That was, um, that was super interesting.